All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm looking forward to this series. Uh, it's going to be wonderful, and George has agreed to kick us off in a, in a really generous way. So we're going to um, be having a little slideshow here. We did print out the slides, but we'll give those to you on the way out so that you're not distracted and uh, looking at them. So you'll have, but you'll have them be able to take home and look for further reflection on them as you go. But uh, this whole idea of art in Advent is something that um, I've worked with before. Uh, this is a season of incarnation, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that relates to singing next week, and then the week after that we'll talk about poetry. But this week, the idea of representing through art, through artistic visual art, artistic representations, um, this story, there's something about it that just captures the imagination and serves as inspiration and has served as inspiration for thousands of years to various artists. So uh, I'm excited to get us started thinking about that as we all enter into this season of incarnation that we will be celebrating at Christmas. So, George, sure. I turn it over to you, my friend. Take us away. Okay. How are you all this morning? Good to hear. That's good. Okay, what, what I wanted to do... I wanted to talk to you about some of the representative works that we have at, that are at the Chrysler. Now, I know a lot of you know a lot about the Chrysler. Some of you probably may not. Let me talk to you just for a moment before we kick off. There's been a museum, art museum, at the, where the Chrysler is now, that location, since 1933. It was called the Norfolk Museum of Arts and Science. In 1971, Walter Chrysler, the automotive heir, and probably the, the largest, greatest uh, art collector in America at that time, gave the bulk of his collection to the city of Norfolk. The condition, the only condition that I'm aware of, was that the museum agreed to change its name to Chrysler. Which apparently we had no had no problem. With. <laughs> he, he had he had a museum in Provincetown, Massachusetts. It was a converted church, but it just wasn't at it was it housed only his collection, and it wasn't adequate. They'd been looking around for a place for some time. They settled on Norfolk. His connection to Norfolk. He was here during the during the war. He was in the navy. And his wife was from Norfolk. But they, ag they agreed to come here to bring his collection here. At the time, it was approximately 10,000 art objects he owned. Or he, he donated it in his initial gift. Now that has grown out to, in 50 years, it's grown to 30,000 works, the, the art that we have there. And I am a docent at the Chrysler. And I give tours. And when I give the tour, I tell them that I'm, uh, the name of the tour is something like Museum Highlights. Mm -hmm. And I, I say, now, and I, I tell them, well, I just told y'all, including the size of the collection, I say, now, we can either do 30,000 pieces, or we can do seven. <laughs> but I'm going to talk to y'all this morning about three. Three representative pieces. The first one is a 19th century uh, oil on canvas. The second one is the early 20th century Tiffany window. And the third one is a 14th century Sienese uh, triptych or uh, altarpiece. So we'll be jumping around quite a bit. Okay, this is the first one I want to talk to you about. It's Thomas Cole's The Angel Appearing to the Shepherds. This was done, this was finished in 1834. Thomas Cole was uh, 32 years old. He would later become the foremost landscape artist in America. He was, he's attributed uh, the founding of the Hudson River School is attributed to Thomas Cole. And he left a legacy of hundreds of paintings that are in museums and galleries 
libraries all over the, all over the country. But he wasn't quite there yet when he did this. Now, this, this painting was a very important juncture in Cole's life for two reasons. The first is the size. He never did before or later anything again to match this. It's eight and a half by 15. With the framing, it's nine by 16. Okay. The second reason was it was something of a financial gamble on his part. Up to that time, he was already fairly successful. Up to that time, he something would be his paintings would be uh, commission, commission, or he'd have some kind of agreement for sale. Well, they were already sold. Not this one. At that time, and we're talking about the 1830s, early in the 19th century. At that, at that time, these panoramic paintings were taken, and they would go. They would be. They would travel on exhibit from town to town. People would pay admission. They would promote these with advertisements in the papers, newspapers. And uh, Cole decided to do that with this painting, with the angels appearing to the shepherds. He started off, he did, he did his work in New York City. He took the painting to, from New York, where it was first exhibited, then to Albany, and then to Boston. So, his tour was from, it was first exhibited in New York, then he took it to Albany, and then he took it to, back down to Boston. Uh, it was very well received by the public. It's, he, when he, after he took it to Boston, it was, it was received, it was included in the collection, permanent collection, at the Boston, is, where's, where's Noah? In, in Boston, in Massachusetts, how do you pronounce Athenian? Do I have it right? Athenian. Athenian. Yeah. I, I know you all do it different. That's why I, <laughs> that's why I, that's why I, that's why I asked. <laughs> anyway, it was taken into the permanent collection there in 1834. Excuse me, 38. And so it remained there until, tragically, there was a fire in 1889. The, the building itself was destroyed, and a number of the paintings. This one was not. It went into storage. Now, rolling up canvas is not bad in and of itself if it's done properly. But that wasn't the case with this painting. It was rolled up without any kind of interior or inner, uh, internal structure or cushioning. Placed in a nine foot tube. At some point, we don't know why, at some point, the tube itself was smashed down and flattened. Mm -hmm. Then to add injury to that, the insult, it was leaned up and then of its own weight it leaned over, toppled over, which increased it. Okay. So it, it stayed in that, in that condition. Okay, now this is what it looked like when it came, when it was unrolled after almost 50 years in that, in that condition. This was still in, 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 it was still in Boston. And it was then, at some point, there was a restora re restoration effort, but it was shoddy. And I'm being charitable. <laughs> it was shoddy, and it consisted of touch-up and a coat of varnish. Oh, okay. Now, what you're seeing now is is what you'll see when you go over to the Chrysler mm -hmm. and look at it, because the restoration is being done now by the Chrysler. Is we've been into it for three years, and that's that's about a week old. That photograph. Mm -hmm. Now you see up there. Yeah. You want to go back a minute, Jamie? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, come forward. How do you obtain the original pictures? 
The one you just showed us. Which one? The one you Prior just showed to us. Prior to that? that, that well, that's what it was to. like three years ago. And we obtained it. Oh. We got it off the, the, the Chrysler website. I thought it was like you were showing no. it all messed up. No. So <coughs> the, that varnish has been removed except for this corner here. <coughs> so I'm just, so oh, for, fortunately we can oh, have yeah. a contrast right now. Okay. All right. Well, I want to I want to say just for a minute. Let me talk about the Hudson River School before we get too far off. Thomas Cole was a very the, the artist. Thomas Cole was a very devout High Church Episcopalian. I, he would he he was an environmentalist in the modern. I don't think so in the modern sense of the word. He was very, very spiritual, and uh, his his, and he combined his religious belief with his the spiritual, what he got from nature, and he was not alone in this. The Hudson, the Hudson River School, his colleagues, fellow artists who were doing landscapes, were of the same mind. I pressed my correspondent who was telling me this, I said, are you sure now? He said, yes. For the most part, all those men were very spiritual. And they were, they painted the Adirondack Mountains, they painted the Catskills, they painted the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And Thomas Cole was their, their port man. So that's just a, a, an aside. Now, it's, he was very devout. As far as his Christian spirituality, look, look at this. There's the angel. Star of Bethlehem, the manger, the shepherds. Now, it, it shows the three, and this is not Christian. This is, this is, this is, uh, it could be pagan, but it's the three stages of man. It's the youth, the manhood, and then there's the elder, the old man. Mm -hmm. go to the next one? It's curious right. that the old man is here. There. Oh, okay. can, can you go back one second, please? Here, you see the lighting around the shepherds? In these paintings, that's a sign of spiritual awareness. This is not lit up. This is. Can you go? Okay. Now, Cole has done something else. Besides simply showing <laughs> the three stages of man, he's showing the what we might call the three uh, three understandings of what they're seeing, the, th the relationship to what they're seeing. This is the youth is incomprehensible and he's afraid. This is the uh, I'll call it right, just manhood. He understands something is going on. He also understands his own uh, weaknesses and he's just not quite grasping the whole thing. And here's the elder and he has a sort of a quiet understanding of what he's seeing and what he understands. And so that is, um, that's, that's our take on the, the angel appearing to the shepherds. And I think of George, can I stop you for one second? Yes, How sir. many of you guys were uh, here for the charrette we did for the Litchgate Garden? Ready? A few of you? You will have seen in that the use of Thomas Cole's Stages of Man as one of the inspirations for the sort of way in which we're trying to redesign that garden and the journey of the river and the life, sort of starting from young age, moving to old age, and the way in which that's reflected in the landscape and one's connection with the divine and an angel in that one, too. I had not made that connection until just now, George, yeah. so thank you. That's really spectacular. Yeah. Okay. Now, th this, this is uh, our second one. This is a Tiffany glass work. Now, Walter Chrysler, Walter Chrysler's family had an estate near Lewis Comfort, Tiffany's estate. In, in, in Glen Cove, New York, on Long Island. Tiffany was, say, two generations older than Walter Chrysler, but Chrysler visited in, in the home with his family. The families knew each other. It was a gift to the museum 
from another collector. And this is a, a sidebar. One of Chrysler's talents was convincing other people to give their collections to his museum. And, and, and the, uh, the contributor here had a collection of Tiffany lamps, and he was, well, he was published. He had um, the booklets and that sort of thing. But this is a wonder that, he, that Chrysler Walter bought from him. Um, the glass, one of the glass people on the staff at the museum pointed out, he thinks this window probably was never exposed to the elements just because of the condition it's in. It was probably one of those windows in a mansion that where the, oh, the, well, the windows and the mantelpiece and the banisters and all that sort of thing from these mansions were salvaged or saved before the home is torn down. And, and Walter was very, he was buying every opportunity he could Tiffany glass, whether it was windows, doors, lamps, lanterns, vases, whatever. Yeah, who recognizes that? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you saying? Our sanctuary. Yeah, it's, it's, it's here in the Selden. It's here in the Selden Chapel, just down the hall from where we're standing. Now, if you look at this, uh, the, it's glass, same glass one. It's Franz Meyer and Company in Munich, Germany, who did the glass for. Christ and St. Luke's Church, along with Lord knows how many other churches here in the, in the States. But if you look at it, the, the, cut, the, the glass is cut. This is lead, lead caming. The glass is cut and inserted into the lead. The glass is also a painted glass, painted with enamel or some other glass. You can see the lead. The lead caming. It the glass literally comes into the caming, and and that's what holds the two pieces together. Now we're back at the Chrysler. This is not lead caming. It's it's copper foil. Each piece of glass is edged with copper foil. Then they're soldered together. Now the reason I'm pointing that out is. When you're learning about this, familiarizing yourself with Tiffany, it's, it's a major feature. Other people did it as well, but Tiffany perfected it and it was used. You can understand why it was more practical in lamps, some of the smaller vessels, than the big heavy windows. Also, the glass, well this is kind of a mixed bag here. But the, the glass is, is, for the most part, colored glass. It's already colored when it is put into the finished product. It's not an afterwards coming on and painting it, literally painting it with enamel. Now, it wasn't, it mean, it didn't happen one day. They stopped using lead one day and started using the copper foil, or they stopped on the same day they stopped uh, using plain glass that was painted and started using colored glass. It's a mixed bag and still is. But in fact, this is a, this example here from Tiffany, that is colored glass. That is painted glass. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to point that out to you. Now also, the Tiffany artisan Sometimes Tiffany had as many as 300 people working for him doing this. Tiffany Artisan also incorporates the three shepherd motif. The elder, the young, and the saint calling the adult, adult of manhood. I wonder if that's a, a universal theme or where it comes from, the three, idea of the three shepherds. It fits, it works. <coughs> I went online and I found one site that had, I guess, 12 or 15 examples of uh, the, the angel appearing to the shepherd. 
Every one of them, except when they were all for a period of hundreds of years, every one of them used the three shepherd motif except one. It's a Raphael that's in the National Museum in London, which interestingly, to me anyway, Thomas Cole saw it when he was on tour over there. And it was an inspiration for the painting that we just saw, saw before this one, the, top, the angel appearing to the shepherds. So that's the first two I wanted to show you. We, we looked at a 19th century oil on canvas, looked at the 20th century Tiffany glasswork, and now we're going to do a complete change of pace. This is a 14th century altarpiece from Siena. When I was looking for, looking for paintings or art objects to use in this talk, um, I had a little trouble. I couldn't find them. I couldn't find many. I own, I own, but I wanted to include a Madonna and Child. So that wasn't the case with Madonnas and Child, I think. There were so many in the museum. We could fill a whole gallery <laughs> and still have plenty to spare. But I found this one because I wanted to use it because it's different. Not only is it a Madonna and Child, but it is a beautiful example of a 14th century uh, t Italian triptych. It, it's done by a NATO, a Chicarelli, Chicarelli is his name. And he was one of a group of people that, a group of artisans in 14th century Siena that perfected the, the, the gold leaf and a tempera style of painting. They used it to emulate works like Minotaurs, the little uh, the vessels and little boxes that would have relics of saints, uh, trip, uh, altar pieces that heretofore were in gold. But they were using, they, they perfected the gold leaf and a, a, a tempera painting. We think this is, was probably in a private home because one, two reasons. One, the size, it's 20 by, it's 20 by 24, which is small for a church. So it was probably used for private devotion. Second reason, the, uh, that, that's the, of course, Madonna and Child. Second reason were the selection of the saints that is called uh, Madonna and Child flanked by four saints. The four saints, uh, they, the th three, of the, three of the four are, they pertain to, to medieval guilds, crafts. He has, He's a goldsmith, patron saint of goldsmith, Saint Bartholomew, patron saint of butchers, Saint Nicholas, patron saint of seafarers. Later, he became Santa, morphed into Santa Claus. <laughs> and Saint Anthony Abbott was the only one that was, um, he was a hermit. Would you see they were all, that they, they were saints of medieval guilds, the first three. And um, I've given y'all a lot of information. Oh, the, uh, the, the statue. Um, I say statue, that was a slip. But it was, you, you see where I was going. Because of the adoration of Mary during the 14th century, it was a whole cult that lasted for, for years and years. And here she's on a plinth, as if she were a statue. They're used in they have a, they have a practical value because they they spread they spread the weight the, the weight of a statue and that sort of thing. But also it is in art in symbolism, it's if you're on a plinth, it separates you from your environment. <coughs> well, I've gone through this pretty quick. These are the corners of the time. Yeah, the, the corners, this is called a dual enunciation, or two-figure two, two figure enunciation. These are both 
These are both angels. Again, I've, I've covered a lot of stuff here quicker than I thought it would. <laughs> so that's, and George, I, I think people are eager to respond and, and, and share their own observations. Would people like I can help sort of manage as we do that? But why don't we start here and work backwards? And if people have comments or observations from all this, would you shout them out? Let's start with Nancy. I know you got something, and then Keith, and then Rob. Yeah, the, the whole three, the three um, shepherds and the stages yeah. of man, whatever. It seems to relate somewhat to the riddle of the Sphinx. You know, that he walks on four legs in the morning and two legs in the noon and three in the evening, although right. it, yes. it's you're, although you're right. it's flipped. Yeah. It's like, the, the, like the wisdom comes from, I don't know, in the evening or something? I don't He seems to yeah. be making a statement with <clears throat> the old guy. <laughs> yeah, well that's sort of what I was talking about at first. Yeah. You, you can have the three figures there, but not have any spiritual. Wait, Christian. Yeah, yeah there seems to be a, making a statement. Yeah, but this is very, this was part of his Christian spirituality. The, the big picture is what those guys had with the Hudson River. Yeah. That's, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if they merged at all with the transcendentalists up in New England, but it sounds very similar. They did. The they did. Yeah. They did. You had said something about, you didn't know if it was pagan or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh, kind of. Keith, go ahead and then run. Well, I just like the contrast between those two ideas, you know, and the, yeah. the nature and the environment is a big part of the message, and that one here or what's here is much, much less. Yeah, that's not scuba. Why don't you, yeah, Jim, go ahead to the uh, to the triptych, where the natural world is not really featured. That's the yeah. 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 you elevate yourself above. Oh, sort of. Outside of the world. Yeah. Right, yeah, that whole yeah. idea yeah. of the plane that George was just saying. No, it's a great point. Excellent. Yeah. What is the for anybody that's interested, Cole's house is a museum now. And you can go in, and they literally left it as he left it. I mean, after he left the house, everything from paintbrushes to whatever are all still in place. Cool. Uh, the studio, the rest of it. Where is it? It's on Hudson. It's up in the house. I'm going to cancel a little bit. Um, and one of the things that you can particularly notice between Tiffany Glass and painted glass is how much brighter Tiffany is. And it's because what he did was he, he he layered his glass to get the color that he wanted out of it. A little more difficult process, yeah. particularly at the time. And um, <clears throat> that, again, painted glass was, was to a certain extent easier to do. And the, re the reason you switch from copper to lead with it was to get rid of the steel bars, or the iron bars, I should say, that you always see on stained glass windows to hold them because the light is so soft a little bit of heat will give it enough uh, useless to come away. Uh, the, big, the big picture of it. So, yeah. Yeah, so you see the bars that go oh, across yeah. to try to hold them to the <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's why he went to the copper foil instead yeah. of um, the other. So with um, copper foil, a window that size wouldn't need the bars? Correct. That oh. That's the benefit of it. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you had a good the trip, Ted. Is that a an alcove where the Madonna is and a freestanding statue, or is that painted? It's painted. Okay, that's so almost the whole perception <laughs> makes yeah. it look almost like it's you know she looks three dimensional almost yeah. in that yeah. in that central central panel. Which is really yeah, amazing. and you guys have seen these right in your various travels. So this sort of these are the sort of threefold altar pieces that um, were beautiful, but also held somewhat of a um, practical function as well in terms of like being a sounding board as far as you know that's where the altar is where you're going to be celebrating and they didn't have microphones or anything like that so you have this almost like the little shelves you see going on at the you know, at a concert or something to help direct the sound and you put these up there and this is you know a solid background to put there that can help with all that more comments questions Vicky, yeah David and then Vicky particularly because the celebrant was facing that yes at that point right bounces ah. yeah but this, I, this one, I don't think that would have necessarily been no. the case, because as George said, it was small, private, yeah. devotional. So once it became an art form, it obviously gets played out in different contexts. But these ideas of sort of something behind the celebrant were devotional for your observation, but also they always hold some of a practical purpose as well. Yeah, Vicki. Uh, three quick things. I also think that they were um, <coughs> to protect the art 
when you're when not in use, you can close it because right. of the dampness in the building. Uh, going back to the coal, yeah. Um, George, thank you for showing us this mm -hmm. because I have never really noticed the nativity in the background. Yeah. yeah no, go I'm ahead. Yeah. About that too. Let's go all the yeah, the big picture there. Yeah. 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 So this, uh, there's there's stars shining. Right. You know, I didn't really pick up on that. And then my third thing is um, right the, right there. the three shepherds, um, where you have the youth on his, you know, on all fours. Yeah. His crook is lying down versus the wise man has his crook up because he's a leader, protector, he has a wisdom. You know, you think of our bishops yeah. carrying the bishop crook, well, all yeah. bishops carrying the crook because they're, they're the leaders and you can follow them and then they use it also to beat the wolves away and whatnot. But yeah. the other ones, see, they don't have their, their crooks nearby. Yeah. Their knees. It is. What's fascinating too is the difference of the, the shading, right? Here you've got this like really strong chiaroscuro kind of thing going on, but then the next one, it actually was a little lighter, <laughs> a little easier to see when they did it. But that's that varnish, I imagine, George, sort of yes. takes away some of that light. But it, it, the, the benefit, at least in this, is that you get these like little pockets, and I, I find that fascinating when I saw this painting because it was. Um, I don't know, I had in my mind this idea of sort of, you know, glory to God in the highest and the angels come out and maybe it's too many Christmas pageants, but everything just gets bright. Everything is bright. But here there's like pockets of brightness spread yeah. throughout. And so it's just interesting to think that it's sort of this, it's a, it's a directed revelation rather than a sort of general revelation, which is more true to scripture, frankly. The angel came to the shepherds or came to various things and the story is telling us about our own personal interaction with that message. Um, On the point, under the angel's hand, where it's also bright, yeah. but not just defined. You see lots of sheep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right it there. Looks like maybe. Is there another sheep? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, right there. Two, there. there are two shepherds right okay. there. In yeah. fact, on this painting, there's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> I mean, I, I was telling Jerry Beckford before it started, books have been written about it. About the whole experience. Sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, John, did you just one last thing. The, some point during this time, the forest from New York City all the way up above Albany had all been deforested. So you had this huge flood that came down through there, which eventually leads to Central Park <laughs> and a bunch of other things along the way. So there was a sense that if you were going to capture nature, you had to go out and do it now. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you were talking about the White Mountains, mm -hmm. there's some waterfall I think up near the White Mountains that the, particularly the Hudson River School painted over and over and over again mm -hmm. for different seasons and whatever. But it was a sense of a return to nature because, again, it was already in the process of being lost. Mm -hmm. We forget how much, when this country got, when, when the colonists first came here, 80% of the surface area of the country was woods. Right. And uh, be surprised how fast you can cut that down to feed your home over winter. Yeah. By the time you get enough people to do it. And so that was the sort of thing that was going on. Yeah. And no, I'll shut up. Oh, no, 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 that's a great that's a fair point. That's a great point. And you see almost there's this uh, I don't think this is exactly true to a Bethlehem landscape, but it does have this sense of sort of uh, of sort of um, a little bit of desolation in there. It's not it, it, there's there's water, there's palm trees, but it, it's not a vibrant forest that you would see in New England. It's a different MO. AJ, you had your hand The forest. Hold on, AJ's going to go next. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah the, if you look at the close up of the, the shepherds, like one thing I noticed, and this is just, yeah, there's still repetitions of, of threes throughout this. Like, well, also, like in the past, the past one, like there's the three palm trees. But here with those figures, it's not quite understand as far as each of those figures, it emphasizes. For each of them, basically three limbs. As far as like we have the old man's like staff and the, and the two legs, and it really de-emphasizes his arms. As far as that goes, the same with the yeah. with the adult man, you have like it emphasizes a leg and his arm, um, and, and as far as that goes, the same with the with the young man. You have the two legs and the one arm, and I just find that interesting that repetition of the trope of the three uh, throughout this painting. There's also like three sheep sort of stand out to them. In a group together there on the yeah. left, and then you have the three palm trees, and just, yeah, just that the, the, the repeating truck of the three throughout, I find really beautiful. Mm -hmm.
Cool. Yeah, so it's one thing I try to say that ties in with what John was just saying. Reading, reading of what these these Hudson River artists was on their minds. It's just like today. I mean, it's just like it could be today. Change a few dates and a few locations. They were very much concerned about the, uh, the environment and what we were already doing. 200 years ago now, because this was done in 18, what I say, 1834. So then it was in, in New York, it was what they were conscious of. They were very conscious of this. It is a stu- How many people have seen this over there? It's just, it's, it's stunning. Yeah, I want to yeah, say something. Go over there when you leave here. <laughs> <laughs> After church, not right now. Yeah. Church over there, the church. The museum opens at noon. And the other day I went over, and the, the, they were in there working on the restoration. I mean, you can see it. I don't know when they, what their hours are or anything, but if you catch them just right, you can see them in action. And They're doing it in the gallery, not yeah, behind the scenes. They're doing it in the gallery. Okay. Oh, I mean, it's, if you see it, it's big, big as this wall, if not bigger. I mean, that's where you get this full sense of, like, the scene is in, sort of enormous. Yeah. It's really impressive. Dan, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, just... You were talking about how it probably doesn't look like the, the, the area it was, and I was wondering, the fortress looks <laughs> desolate. Yeah. Okay, uh, I can you see start. three repeated in <clears throat> yeah. the fortress also, but yeah. it's uh-huh. it's kind of dominating over there, yet it looks like, well, it's had its day, and whoever was there are gone. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. Okay, okay. Do, do you want me to tell you where it was? It's, it's Italy. He it's supposed to be Italy, Italy, yeah. Italy. He was on his way to the Holy Land. He didn't get there. <laughs> they got, side, enough, right? they got <laughs> sidetracked. But this, this is where he took away from Italy. So that, that was the thinking. That's the landscape. That's fine. Other questions or comments to wrap up here? But can you see how, can you start to see how um, our imaginations are formed by not just the stories that we hear, but the way in which they're told, right? The manner in which they're communicated. And so you get artwork like this, uh, or you get music, or you get poetry that take what is, actually, if you look at scripture, a pretty banal story, and expands upon it, and it allows us to engage in ways that are, you know, stimulate the mind, but also the heart, and start to inspire such that others then produce works in accordance with this, just this very simple story, which is uh, rather remarkable, rather impossible when, you, when you're looking at the details of it, and yet forms one of those two pillars of incarnation and resurrection, which hold up our whole Christian faith. Um, so, George, this is a great start. Everyone, let's give George a round of applause. <laughs> One of the great opportunities, like you said, is to go and look at some of these works of art, yes. many of the other Madonnas and Child uh, that are around. Uh, we have that great benefit right down the street, so it's really a, a great joy for us to be able to do that.